Amen. Shall we just pray? Father, we, we are so grateful for a wonderful Sunday that you have given us again, the first Sunday of the month of August. Father God, as people are traveling, people are going to different places, meeting different new people, we are here today, this Sunday, and we are so grateful for another privilege to come and worship and to praise you. Amidst of our friends and families and wonderful, lovely people who we meet together. We ask that today will be a day of blessings. All that we will hear today through your word, even beyond the things that we have already heard, in the testimonies, in the opportunity to give unto you, we ask, O oh God, that you will let the cause of our lives continue to go in the right direction. Father, we praise and we honor you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. The title of the talk I have for us today is called Gaining Joy all the time. Gaining joy all the time. And I'm going to start from the point where I mentioned that we ask questions for various reasons. How many of you have ever asked a question before? Yeah? Or somebody's asking a question. There are about six reasons why we ask questions or why people ask questions. I'll just go through them quickly because I don't have too much time. Number one, we ask questions because we have the need for an answer. So when we say, when is your ETA? Um, we're saying, when is your expected time of arrival? And that is to say that I need to know so that I can prepare myself for when you said you want to arrive. Or people can prepare for you for when you say you want to arrive. Amen. Amen. So, when you ask, what time, what is your ETA, you need an answer. Amen? The second reason why we ask questions is because the person asking the question might want to test you. Might want to test you um, when they ask you a question saying like, have you measured the, the length of that room or is just a guesswork? Or is a guess measure, or is a guess um, measurement that you have given to me or did you actually measure it? They want to test you because they suspect that perhaps you didn't really measure it. You have just given them a figure or a number. So sometimes we ask questions because we want to test the person. Another way or reason why we ask questions is we ask questions because we want to accuse somebody. You want to accuse somebody because you, you reckon that they should have done something or they have done something that warrants you that maybe you didn't agree with. So you ask them a question to accuse so that you pin down the person who has done it. What have you done in all that time that you've been awake? What you are saying to that person is that perhaps they've been seated in front of the TV watching Sky News, watching the match between Arsenal and Chelsea today, knowing that you no know, someone is going to win. So you are, you, you are saying, uh, asking that question, accusing them of something specifically. Another reason why we ask question is you ask question to delay or to get somebody off your attention. If somebody was on your case and they are following you all around, you can ask a question. To them, Why are you following me? Because they are just, as it were, a fly that is just hanging on the wall watching you. And you want to get them off your back. So you ask them a question. Am I the only person that you can see here? You ask a question, not necessarily because you need an answer, but you want to get them off your attention. Another reason why we ask questions is to express disagreement or disapproval about something that has been done. Why would you give me change or give me my change in that many coins? 
You are saying, I don't really need those coins because each time I have coins, I don't know how they disappear. I prefer you to give me a five pounds note than give me all those coins that you want to give to me. So you, you, you ask a question just to express a disagreement or disapproval. You also ask questions to exact power. To exact the fact that you are the boss or you are the one that is in charge. Maybe somebody has done something around you and you said, can you give me three strong reasons why you came late to the office today? You are not just trying to get an answer from them. You want them to feel somehow that coming at that time they came was not the right time. So you ask a question, three good reasons. And maybe you know that they cannot even give you one. Did I say six reasons? I think there are seven. The last one is to make a cynical statement, you can also ask, I mean, ask a question. Can you let me know how the grocery will last for another whole week? Because you have seen the way that the, 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 first, the first take of the cereal was a full three bowls. And the cereal was meant to last for a whole week. So you are asking, now if you are eating like this, on the first day. How will this cereal last us for a whole week? I don't need an answer. I just want you to know what you are doing. The damage you are causing. The confusion that your action is likely to bring. So we ask questions for various reasons. And every single one of us, we have reasons to ask questions at, po at different points in time in life. The questions we ask vividly give more understanding about our position or our background. It reveals our struggle. The questions we ask reveals our expectations in life. It reveals our fears and the things that we are going through. The fear that we have about the future, we can get it from the questions we ask. In the book of Judges chapter 6, Judges chapter 6 Verse 13 and 14, Gideon sarcastically asked God or the angel that appeared to him, that said to him that God is with you. That was what the angel said to Gideon. God is with you. And Gideon looked into his life. Guess what he said? And I read this through. He says, Sir, this is Gideon answering the angel. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has it, why has all this happened to us? And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Gideon had a catalogs of questions to ask because he didn't believe what the angel had just spoken to him. He didn't know that it, there could be any way that God could be near him because of the things that he was going through or they were going through as a people and as a nation. In Psalm 30 verse 9, David asked another question he says, David was asking God. He says, what profit is there in my blood when I go down the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Expressing that God will have nothing to gain in his death, David was asking in agony and pain, God, what profit is there in my blood? If you allow me to die like this. If you allow me to be going through what I'm going through. What does it profit you? More or less comparing how glorifying his being alive to God will be. Than God allowing his life to be unnecessarily terminated. 
David was saying, God, I, can't, I don't get it. Doesn't it make sense to keep people like me alive than allowing for me to be badly dealt with like this? It is a strong argument when you hear a statement like this from a typical committed person to God who is not afraid to die, not that they are afraid of death, but they are more concerned that their being alive or in death is a joy to him and again to God. He was very concerned and feel it is just right that people like him should be alive. Serving God and doing good than to allow them to be locked up in a grave where nothing can be get out of them anymore. Paul declared in Philippians 2.17 He said, Hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, I will be proud that I did not run the race in vain and that my work was not useless. But I will rejoice even if I lose my life, pouring it out like a liquid offering to God. Just like your faithful service is all is an offering to God and I was all of you to share that joy. In this picture, Apostle Paul is painting to us that there is a way that we can, from the position of how our relationship is with God, we can ask God legitimate questions to let him consider that we should be better looked after. We should be in a more, in, in a more appealing position or situation of life than be left to be taunted around the way we feel sometimes. And what is best for us to get out of this at first, as we go through it this morning, is that each and every one of us needs to look at our lives, look at our situation, look at our circumstances, and see when you are going through it, what crosses your mind? Do you feel in your heart or does it occur to you that your conscience says to you, you deserve it? Or you're saying, ah, I don't deserve this. I can go and get justice. I can go to God. Because if, if you look at whatever it is that is in your heart, you will know whether you have a case or not. You will know whether you can go to God because the God we serve is a very reasonable God. Is an understanding God. Is a God who is not a bully. He listens to people. He says, bring your case to me. Let us reason together. Let us look at the facts. Let us look at the things that you are talking about. David declare in Psalm 44 verse 12, Lord, will thou sell one of thy own people for naught? And not increase thy wealth by the price. He's saying, will you, will you not, I mean, will you allow one of your children, faithful children to be dealt with like this? Or will you allow them to have a better or pricier stake or price? It is for us to look at what our lives is at every point in time. And this morning, my prayer and my declaration is that for every single one of us listening to me, today will be a day of gladness, a day of rejoicing, and a day of thanksgiving in our lives in the name of Jesus Christ. Because as we're talking about David, in Psalm 103, verse, Psalm 103, verse 1, he was very mindful of the worth of his life to God, that he declares that bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefits. 
He said, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. And bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all of his benefit. And he listed out all the things that God has done for him. When we have an attitude like this, attitude of gratitude, I call them, what it shows is that we are able at every time look inward in our lives so we can have the right perspective that we should praise God and talk about God from. As we have this attitude of gratitude, like I call it, one thing that is most important, even as we say, is a season of, is a season of sweetness that we're experiencing, a season of gladness, a season of joyful experiences, a season where God is outpouring upon us to see that we are wonderfully cared for and felt as though God is indeed around us. There is a way that you can look in your life and have what I call joy around you at all times. How is it that you can have joy around you at all times? I'm going to mention seven ways that we can have joy around us and maintain it. Because there is not just sweetness. There must be something that leads to sweetness. It is not just for us to wake up and just having a wishing kind of party where you're just wishing that you are happy. No. There must be something that is well springing on in your heart that makes you to have that joy. That well spring. That no matter what is happening outside you cannot even affect it. I've seen people where you no, know, very recently we, we spoke about a, one of the um, guys who passed through here um, who, who was a student in Brunel. And recently, his mom passed away. And we went to visit them. For every person who encountered this young man, it was undoubtedly one of the amazing sights to behold. He was the one encouraging everybody that came to encourage them. He was the one that was, no, 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 it's not that bad. I mean, the mom just died. No, 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 it's not that bad. It is the fact that she's done so good. She's done so well. And, I mean, it was just overwhelming the way that he's taking this and taught it through and be a blessing to everybody. In fact, on the day of the funeral, people were quoting him that as, as he, they mentioned his name, as he said to us, as he encouraged us, as he was saying to us, they were quoting him. They didn't even quote the pastor. Why? Because he's been able to look at it. Look at the whole situation and maintain a position that this cannot affect my relationship with God. Every single one of us, we need to get to a stage of our lives where nothing that is happening around us is strong enough to affect or impact on our relationship with God. Because if we don't do this, there are ways that things are thrown at us on a daily basis. There are ways that things happen around us that throw us off our feet, that make us to lose our, our balance. So seven ways to keep joy around you always. Number one, practice the reason you trust God. Just practice it. Take your Bible and go to a page where the Bible talks about us trusting God and read it to yourself and read it to God. Let God hear you that God, you are the one I'm reading this to, that you are the one who blesses me. You are the one who look after me. You are the one who provides for me all the days of my life. You are the one who will not make my enemies to have, to, to have um, power over me. You are the one who will not make me to go through the valley of the shadow of death and not be looked after. You begin to read these things to yourself and to God. When you do that long enough, you will begin to have the mindset of someone who knows that no matter what happened, my relationship with God must be one that brings gratitude. 
you go to specific places, you deliberately go and read and practice. If you like, read it to yourself in a mirror. I've done that before. In those days when I was learning to preach, when I've not, you know, really started to preach, I will take my Bible and I will go to where the mirror is. I know the mirrors are always near the toilet. I will take my notes and I will start preaching. To who? To myself. In the mirror. Until I was confident enough to preach to one person. And of course, of course you know who that person is. And then you can preach to two people or three people. And one day you can preach to somebody. If you are thinking, how am I going to get through that? Start to practice it. If you practice it long enough, it will become, it become part of you. Is there somebody who doesn't know how to work? You can stand up and then stagger and fall. But if you stand up long enough, one day you stand up and you will not fall. You might be swinging right and left, but you won't fall. Why? At least you've gotten the balance to stand. And then one day you start to take steps. And then you start to take steps. That is what it takes to have a heart of gratitude. That is what it takes to have joy around you. There is a time when you will, anything that happens around you will affect you. And there are people like that. If anything happens, they have a very, you know, rumpled look around them or on their faces. But try and practice consciously. When things don't go your right way. Maintain an attitude of joy. That doesn't matter. You can just pass. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Because those things, in the real sense of things, don't matter. So check it. Practice it. Tell it to yourself. Tell it to a friend. Tell it to God. Number two. Keep a joy journal. Keep a joy journal. You know, because of how our brain is as human beings, it is always very easy to forget things. Because we are always looking for the next thing. It's like somebody who is on heroin, always looking for the next fix. The next fix. The next fix. Many a times, we forget the many things that God has done for us because we're looking for the next one that he will do. So it doesn't seem as though he's done anything. And that is very, very sad. Because looking at every single one of us here, if you tell me God has not been good to you, I can look at you and tell you 10 reasons straight away how God has been good to you. So keep a joy journal. Some people don't just do a journal, they do a joy box. They have a box, maybe a shoe box. The last shoe they bought at whatever it is they buy their shoes from. They just say, I won't throw this one away. It looks so nice. They just cut a hole in front of them and call joy box. Anytime something good happened to them, they quickly scribble it neighbor and just drop it into it. The next time you have issues that wants to trouble you, just go and open your joy box. What do you see there? You see arrays of good news. That is showing up at you. That you know what? If the same God that you serve is the one that did all this, He's still the same God that good to you. Keep a joy box. It will flood your heart with joy at all times. Number three, if you want to maintain joy around you always, surround yourself with joyful people. Surround yourself with who? Joyful people. Do you know that there are joyful people? Oh, yes. If you look closely, you will find one or two around you. I'm not saying you should hate those who are not joyful people, but you should mind your gap, like they say on the underground, with them. Because there's a way that joy can be contagious. But the same way that joy can be contagious, the other spirits can be contagious. All those things, they have a way of carrying a very powerful, sense, dingy spirit. I remember 
it was October last year when, when my, my dad passed away. And the first time I was going home, going to go and visit about just under a week after the thing happened. When I was going home, you know, when they've announced that the first son is going to arrive, everybody has come. Everybody arrived at the house. They were waiting for me. And they're waiting for me, maybe for various reasons. They were waiting for me to know how, some of them are waiting for me to know the gear of the cry I'm going to cry so that they can also increase their own gear. <laughs> so as I was coming from the airport going to the house, I could see tangibly there was one heavy spirit of grief that was on the house. My God. I was thinking, how am I going to enter this house? And everyone was, was looking up. As soon as I was, they won't talk. Just, I had planned what I was going to do. I had determined what I was going to do. That this spirit, you won't get me. This spirit is not meant for me. You are not resting on me one bit. As I got into the house, I looked at everybody. I said, wow, it's good to see all of you. Let us just pray. And I just started a song, a joyful song. I just said, I said, I'm so happy for the life my dad lived. As soon as I said, you can see their faces changing from grief to joy, from pity to happiness. Everything was just changing, changing, changing. Before we know it, we're shouting, hallelujah, wonderful, powerful. Wow. That was the atmosphere I slept that day. If you don't consciously look at it, you will be drawn into it. All these things are spirit. So there are people, naturally, they are joyful people. Some of them can even not tell you why they are joyful. In fact, some people have joyful faces. When they can't help but smile. Even when they are angry, they are smiling. Find one or two of such people. I mean, there are some people, their, their, their lips are just, they're just smiling, ever smiling. When you have such people around you, it reminds you of a reason to be joyful. So find one or two of people like that. Number four, to have joyful atmosphere around you always, approach life's challenges and trials redemptively. Anytime things happen around you, look at it as though it is, it can be changed. There's nothing that cannot be transformed or changed. Amen? There's nothing that you are going through that cannot be dealt with, transformed, and bring joy one way or the other. You need to determine how that you want it to happen in your own situation. It is you who will know what God will do for you. Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans in Romans 5 1. He said, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Whatsoever happens to you, carry that mindset by faith. Carry that mindset by faith that, you know what, in my relationship with God, I've got peace in this situation. Even when you don't see any kind of trail of peace, you need to prophesy it. You need to declare it. You need to sanction it. Amen? You need to make anyone that cares to know, anyone that cares to understand, anyone that cares to appreciate what God is doing around you to know that this is where you belong to. Because if you don't know where you belong, if you don't show where you belong to, you will be docked in different kind of situation around you. Number five. If you want to have joy around you at all times and maintain it, make praises and gratitude a habit. Make praises and, act, I mean, and, um, and add gratitude, make it a habit. Do you know, just saying thank you, even to people around you, is so important. Just thank you. Somebody opened the door for you. Thank you. But somebody opened the door for you. You just walk past. Say, what, what would you have done? If you don't open the door, what would you have done? 
I thought you were a gentleman. The next time they don't open the door for you, then you start complaining. Appreciate the little ones, the little bits that they have done. Somebody bought you a travel card. What I've been asking you for is a car, not a travel card. The person that bought a travel card can say buy a car. Why? Because by faith you know that it will happen. You bought a travel card, it's even not, not it doesn't cover all the zones. <laughs> doesn't, only, only a bus pass. They can't even receive it on the they can't take it on, on the bus. A gratitude heart. You appreciate the tiniest of things. And don't let that spirit, you know, there's a spirit in the kind of culture that we are in that makes you feel as though, you, oh, you don't need to, you don't have to. You, you, I mean, we watched the drama here the other day, the, the, the playlet where there's a guy on the bus, I forgot his name now, the guy was on the bus, and there was a pregnant woman standing, and, you know, he was supposed to give the, the space on the bus to the pregnant woman, and he didn't even bother. Do you know what we're saying is that in some cases, if you find a real gentleman who did that and gave the space, do you know there are some people that will say, no, 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 you don't have to do that. No, no, please don't bother. Sit down. And because of that, you two now sat. Now say, they say, I should not worry. You were not going to worry in the first place. That's the bottom line. You were not going to worry. Do it genuinely. Do it, do it as though it is your duty to do it. If you don't do it, it is not right. It is not on. I mean, I always say that I find it difficult to, when a, a lady drives me, I just find it difficult. I mean, maybe, maybe like three or four times. If I was in that, unless they cannot drive. If they can drive, I will not say because you can drive that you can to drive. No, I, I enjoy to drive a lady. When I see a lady driving me, I just feel, you, you don't look responsible. <laughs> you don't. It doesn't look responsible. And someone who just sat and I say, <laughs> my, 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 my brother-in-law of blessed memory, you know, my brother-in-law, in those days, he, we all were challenging ourselves who was going to learn driving first. Then I got dry, I mean, I started driving. Then Tony got started driving. Then his wife started driving. And so we're encouraging him that, ah, bros, start driving now. He said, ah, driving. Very simple thing, just like this. I'll just do it like this. So, ah, he will be saying, so one day we said, look, this, you're like this. We want to see it happen. We want to see it happen. Ah, ah. You just say it's like this, like this. No, the day he went and tried driving, he said, no, it's not like that. And it took time to now learn it. And he started driving. What I'm saying is that they say joy. I don't wait. I mean, if I have any chance to take my wife to somewhere, I would rather she doesn't drive. I will take her there. Why? Because I enjoy it. I'm happy to do it. She doesn't need to beg me to do it. Amen. So have it, but when I do it and you say thank you, <laughs> I will do it the next time. That's what I'm saying. I'll do it the next time. But when they do it, when somebody did something for you and appreciate you, let them find the joy that you also appreciate what they have done, no matter how tiny it is. If you're asking them to give you a, I mean, a birthday present and they went out and bought you a birthday card, a card, do you know a card is a present with the wardens inside? But when you look at it, you, you look at it, you open it. <laughs> Nothing dropped. Ah. You, you, first, you first put the card, you put the card down and then you go to the toilet. You, you, you're thinking about what should I say? What should, how do I deal with this? But this is a very provoking situation. <laughs> Calm down. Amen? Calm down. You don't know whether the, the, 
the gift is still coming. This is just, this is just um, <laughs> praise God. It's good to have a heart of gratitude. Make praise and gratitude a habit. And habits are something that you just try, you try, but one day to become part of you. It becomes a habit. You can't do it without saying it. Number six, fill your mind with music of joy. Thank God for those God has given beautiful voices to sing. Beautiful wardens of songs. Listen to them again and again. This psalm is such a good place to derive the mindset of joy. David was one of the most gracious people in the Bible. He, he had a way of thanking God for everything. He was, able, he, he was able to thank God for killing his enemy. In other places, he was able to thank God for preserving his enemy to see how he was going to enjoy the things that God has done for him. So he didn't say, God, kill my enemy. Kill. No, no, no. There's some days he said, no, no, God, don't kill this one. Let him see how I am enjoying what they don't want me to enjoy. He thanked God for that. David was a smashing guy coming to being, gra being gracious and having a heart of gratitude. We also should be the same. Let us have such, uh, and we can pick it up from the right angle. Read books about joy. Read books that will bring you happiness and gladness all around you. No matter how tiny it is, find something. That's why the testimony is this morning, so bless my heart. You might look at it and say, what, what, what are they thanking God for? I thought they were going to say that, you know, they, they, they just bought a new car. No, no, no. If you know what it is to move around in a good car, you appreciate when you drive one. <laughs> you know, the other day, you were going somewhere, and if you had a car that somebody took you in, just for five minutes, to just have a ride. It is good enough. Because the, you that rode in a car that is good for five minutes, one day you ride it for one hour. It is a matter of time. It's a matter of seasons. Maybe about our jobs. You think about the first job you did ten years ago. Think about it. The first job you did. And compared to the job you're doing now. Massive difference. I remember where I worked first. Today I thank God for what I do. Fill your mind with music of joy. Number seven and the last one is take a long view about life. Always take a long view. So when you take a long view, it helps you to project ahead of what is coming. You don't just focus about what is going to happen here. If you are thinking about what is going to happen here alone, you will not plan for tomorrow. You will not plan for what is coming ahead of you. So with life, God wants us to have that sense of view about, I mean, a world view of joy with an expectation. You know, the Bible says the expectations of the heart of the righteous, God will not cut off. Why it will not be cut off is that we are expecting it. You are looking forward to it. And if you look forward to it long enough, you find out that there's no way you can escape it. Because anyhow it comes, you will get it. Many are times when we are waiting for things, we have a specific way that we want it to come. We don't have a long view of it. We don't have, what if it comes in a different way? Because if you, if you have that liberty to look at it, that it may come in a different way, what we then have is that you will be prepared, will be prepared in your mind to know that however it comes, my says is going to come wearing a white shirt and in a brown trouser, but it could come in a yellow shirt. But however it is, you will get it. Opportunities have worked past those who needed them in life, and they never took notice of it. Why? They had a different mindset. They had a different understanding. They have a different image of what they are expecting. My prayer today 
is that God Almighty will so instruct our mind, will so bless us with the, with the understanding that will help us to know that God has a great purpose for our lives in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Let's just bow our heads and pray. And as we pray this morning, what I want us to pray to God about first is God, any one of these areas that we have talked about that you know, maybe you are lacking in it. Maybe you don't appreciate things enough. You don't have joyful people around you. You don't keep a joy, a, a joy journal. You, don't, you, you have not been practicing how to, how to trust him or what reason you have to trust him. This one, you just want to say that God give me an opportunity and an ability to be able to do this. To be able to do this. Because when we look at it, Bible says in, in Romans 8, 28, it says all things work together for good. All things work together for good. To them who love God. If you love God, today let your expectation be that God allow me to experience this joyful seasons of life. Allow me to experience these joyful seasons that will bring transformation my way in different direction. Ask God. No, the psalmist say in Psalm 116 verse 1, say, I love the Lord because he had heard my voice and my supplication. Even as you are asking God this morning to say, give me a heart that cherishes things more, that appreciates things more, that is filled with joyful people. I'm asking, even as I'm praying, God, I know you can hear me and I know you answer me. I know you can hear me and I know you answer me. I know you can hear me and I know you will answer me. Let your heart be today that you will have that opportunity to move closer to God having a heart of gratitude. Rather than concentrate on the things that worries you, turn for a moment and focus on the things that brings joy to your heart. Things that bring joy into your spirit. Father God, we thank you and we bless you. We honor you, God. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. I'm going to read one more scripture and then we just use it to pray. And then I will take my seat. I read from the book of Nehemiah chapter 9 verse, verse 9. Chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 9 and 10. I read 9 and 10. It says, And Nehemiah, which is the Tashatha, and Ezra, the priest, the scribe, and the Levite that taught the people, said unto all the people, this day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the word of the law. Then he said unto them, verse 10, verse 10, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our God. Neither be sorry, for the joy of the Lord is in your strength. Here, Nehemiah was making an effort to change the mindset of the people from themselves to other people. He says, go and have fun. Go and have something to eat. But by the way, as you are doing that, take a little and also give to people who do not have anything. And as you are doing that, know within you that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Today, I prophesy over you that the joy of the Lord is your strength. 
I prophesy and I release this word over your life. You might not see anything that looks like joy around you. But the joy of the Lord is not in what you see. The joy of the Lord is in his promises. The joy of the Lord is in what he has said he will do concerning you. Is in what he has promised that you will see eventually. Regardless of what you are experiencing or not. Today the joy of the Lord will envelope you. The joy of the Lord will saturate through into every area of your life. In your present, in your past and in your future. In the things that you want to do that you don't, know, you don't even know how you are going to go about it. The joy of the Lord will strengthen you. It will guide you. It will direct you. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Father God, we thank you so much. We bless you because we can always look around us at all times. Especially on a day like this, the first Sunday of the month of August. We call it Super Sunday because our expectation is so great and super indeed. Knowing fully well that you, the God who have kept us from the beginning of this year in January through February, March, April, May, June, July. And now we're in August. We know that you, the same God, you are able, more than able to keep us through into the rest of this year. Particularly, oh God, in this month of August, we ask of you that your overwhelming joy will fill our heart. That gladness will swing round about us, O oh God, and make us to have the joy of every moment, the joy of gladness in everything that we do in the name of Jesus Christ. Father God, we ask of you, O oh Lord, that there will be joy springing forth in and around us at everything that we touch and wherever we go in the name of Jesus Christ. Let nothing be strong enough to overwhelm us. Let nothing be strong enough to cave us in. Let nothing be strong enough to misdirect us in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father God, we give you praise. We honor you, O God. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Make sure you add us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. And visit the church website.